It's truly amazing uh, the number of conditions that respond favorably to cannabis. We're looking at an unexcelled wonder plant, herbal medicine that has no comparison. It would appear that uh, cannabis and hemp are one of the first plants that have been grown in agriculture. We came out of being hunters and gatherers about 10,000 years ago, and so that's at least the length of time that cannabis has been uh, cultivated. Cannabis has long been known as a medicinal uh, plant, as a medicinal product. The latest studies or the latest findings are a tomb in China in which the contents of the medicine bag of a medicine man were discovered and one of the things that it contained was cannabis. The tomb was carbon dated as almost 5,000 years old. The conventional wisdom which uh, goes to the oral history of China is that the Emperor Shan Nen wrote the first uh, Chinese Materia Medica and that it contained uh, cannabis. He is alleged to have written it in 2637 BC, which would be uh, almost 5,000 years ago. The oldest known copy of that goes back to somewhere between 100 BC and 100 AD. The oldest actual written record of the use of cannabis as a medicine is found in the writings of the Indian, as in India, Ayurvedic medicine, in which that uh, a piece of uh, history is dated at somewhere between 1100 and 1700 BC. Cannabis is found in every major Materia Medica that has ever been written. That includes the Ebers Papyrus from Egypt. It includes the writing of Descortes, who was uh, Nero's doctor and uh, his Materia Medica was used for over a thousand years. And it was included in the United States Pharmacopeia from 1854 until 1941. Marijuana uh, has been a medicine for a lot longer than it hasn't been a medicine. Evidence suggests that uh, it was used in Northern China uh, for either shamanistic purposes, religion, or, or healing and the culture of cannabis as medicine moved uh, across the world. Um, India was very big in the use of marijuana and it was from India that W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who was worked for the British East Indies Company, picked up cannabis and brought it to the United Kingdom where apparently it was Queen Victoria's favorite uh, treatment for her menstrual cramps. Ultimately it came to the U.S. and in the early part of the 20th century, most of the major drug companies in this country were actually producing cannabis uh, medicines. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, cannabis was probably the second or third most commonly used medicine in the world. Uh, cannabis was found in uh, patent medicines that were manufactured by such uh, familiar names as Eli Lilly, Squibb, Merck, Park Davis, uh, Smith Brothers, you know, the Smith Brothers cough drops. Uh, and it was available uh, powdered, uh, chopped, uh, whole, and uh, as tinctures. It was only in uh, 1937 when Congress enacted the Marijuana Tax Act that imposed uh, a levy of a dollar an, an ounce for the use of medical marijuana that uh, was the beginning of, of the end for marijuana as a medicine in the United States. It was in 1942 that it was totally removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia or the formulary, but up until 1942, physicians could still write prescriptions for cannabis. So, you know, marijuana hasn't been a medicine for 68 years uh, in this country, but it has been a medicine in the world for 3,000 years. There was the uh, misconception uh, that use of marijuana led to uh, debauchery and physical violence and for that reason uh, I guess the investigator I, I guess we were probably more conservative than we are, than we are now but that's hard to believe uh, so it was considered um, the way alcohol was considered back in the time of prohibition 
And so it was pro prohibited all uses of marijuana because it had been used medicinally as well as for recreational, recreationally. So all uses were um, declared illegal and marijuana then was given the status of a Schedule One substance, which means a substance without any recognized, any de demonstrable therapeutic effects, as opposed to cocaine, which was also uh, declared illegal for ec recreational use, but it still had medicinal properties as in a local anesthetic, for which it is used today, to this day. And that's Schedule Two. When the Marijuana Tax Act was passed in 1937, uh, immediately Fiorella LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York, established a, an august body of scientists uh, to investigate whether the claims that marijuana use was going to increase mental illness and crime in the United States uh, were valid. And the LaGuardia Commission report was uh, issued in 1942, and they concluded uh, that marijuana was a, a good medicine and that the claims that its use would increase crime and mental illness were unsubstantiated. Prohibition cannot be enforced for the simple reason that the majority of American people do not want it enforced and are resisting its enforcement. That being so, the orderly thing to do under our form of government is to abolish a law which cannot be enforced, a law which the people of the country do not want enforced. Uh, that sentiment was uh, uh, repeated in 1972 when the Nixon Marijuana Commission uh, wrote their report. Uh, this was in the face of the admonition by President Nixon that they not uh, recommend uh, the legalization of cannabis for recreational use. Oh, there is a commission that is supposed to make recommendations to me about this subject. The recommendation of the uh, commission in its first report is that we do not feel that private use or private possession in one's own home should have the stigma of criminalization, that uh, people who experiment should not be criminalized for that particular behavior. Every 10 years or so, our government has sponsored another look into marijuana as medicine. The last one actually now being 1999, when the Institute of Medicine did it. And every 10 years, these august bodies come up with the same conclusion, that there's medicinal value to marijuana and its, its adverse effects and addictive potential and gateway drugness are overstated. And for some reason, every 10 years, these reports go, I don't know if they're ignored, but they certainly don't seem to change policy. In 1974, uh, a fellow with glaucoma who was going blind named Robert Randall uh, was arrested for possession of uh, marijuana. He had found that using the marijuana had diminished the symptoms that he was having. And it was later found by both Johns Hopkins and the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA that this was the only thing that would preserve his eyesight. And the federal government then agreed to provide uh, Mr. Randall with marijuana for medical purposes. He had made an agreement, or the government thought he had made an agreement, not to tell anybody about this. Well, as soon as it happened, he told as many people as he could. Uh, and began to spread the word and people began to apply for this program which was called the IND program. At one time there were as many as 15 Americans who were receiving 300 hand-rolled marijuana cigarettes a month from the federal government. Uh, and there were another 35 people who were approved for the program. In 1989, the first Bush administration decided that they needed to review this. They were concerned that too many people were applying for the program and if too many people got on it, 
the public might get the quote wrong idea that marijuana actually had some medical value, which of course it actually does have some medical value. Just prior to that time in 1988, the chief administrative law judge of the Food and Drug Administration issued a ruling recommending that marijuana be rescheduled from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. In his ruling, he found that marijuana was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man, and he stated that it was safer than eating 10 potatoes. So I've always been very careful about the number of potatoes I've eaten since then. Marijuana was widely used in the 19th century for the treatment of asthma. And in the 1970s, we found that uh, marijuana uh, has a bronchodilator effect. It's because of the THC in marijuana. First of all, let's contrast, or compare and contrast, marijuana with the other even more widely smoked substance in our society, tobacco. The tobacco was used more widely than any other smoked substance, and marijuana is second only to tobacco. Lucy? Yes, dear? Give me a cigarette, will you, hon? Don't say cigarette, say Philip Morris. Oh? Is there any other kind? Not for you, there isn't. Nothing but the best for Mr. Ricardo. Thank you. Lucy, you're so good to me. You see how easy it is to keep a man happy? Why not give your husband a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes? Smart move. He'll love them for their mildness, their smoothness, and their wonderful good taste. And he'll love you, too, for thinking of him. That's right. Good night, everybody. And don't forget, call for Philip Morris. Call for Philip We know that if you analyze the contents of tobacco and marijuana, they're quite similar. The major difference is that, that, that tobacco contains nicotine, not found in, in marijuana, and marijuana contains THC and about 60 other THC-like substances called cannabinoids, not found in tobacco. But there are other, a lot of other particulates that are shared in common, and these include carcinogens such as benzpyrene, the most potent of the carcinogens and considered to be responsible for a large percentage of human cancers. Uh, benzpyrene is found in 50% higher concentration in marijuana smoke than in the smoke from a comparable quantity of tobacco. And this has been shown by three separate groups of chemical investigators. So the uh, expectation is that if you smoke marijuana enough and on a regular basis, that you would incur similar risks to smoking tobacco. So what are the major health risks for tobacco? Uh, emphysema, which I prefer to call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's the new term, it consists of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. But you could have significant impairment in lung function without emphysema, it could just be due to airways disease we call small airways disease, but because we can't separate out the two components of COPD, emphysema, and the airways component, we, we lump them together. So that's COPD. So now COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. and in the world, and will become the third leading cause in 2020. So it's a very important disease. About 120,000 Americans die each year uh, from, uh, from COPD. Probably the best evidence for separating out, uh, the best method for separating out a COPD patient from someone else is to look at the rate of decline in lung function. I shouldn't say the best, it's the, probably the most uh, uh, informative. But it's more difficult to do because you have to make measurements every year for a number of years. And so you get a slope of the rate of loss of lung function over time. We did that. We actually measured lung function every year in uh, our marijuana smokers up, up to eight years. And we found that the slope of the decline in lung function was almost identical in the marijuana only smokers compared to the non-smokers where it was accelerated in the tobacco smokers. So just one other piece of evidence that uh, marijuana is not a risk factor for the development of COPD. I think I'm convinced of that. And the other major health consequence, pulmonary health consequence of tobacco is lung cancer. Cancer is the second most common cause of death 
uh, in, in the U.S. And lung cancer is the most common form of cancer. And the major risk factor for lung cancer is tobacco smoking. About 160,000 Americans die each year of lung cancer. So the question that came to my mind and that of my colleagues was whether or not there was any evidence that marijuana would at least qualitatively share some of these health risks with those of tobacco. And that uh, was the rationale for initiating our studies back in the 1980s. What is the evidence that marijuana smoking, habitual marijuana smoking, can lead to lung cancer? With respect to the development of lung cancer, uh, we uh, found no evidence of any increased risk of lung cancer uh, occurrence in association with marijuana smoking alone. The marijuana smokers, if anything, had a reduced risk for developing lung cancer. Not a significantly reduced risk, but reduced less than a one-fold. So that means reduced. Whereas the tobacco smokers had a markedly increased risk. If uh, the, those who smoke more than two packs a day had a 20-fold increase in the risk. That's 2,000%. Those who smoke from one to two uh, packs a day uh, had an eightfold risk. It's 800 so, percent. Um, so that contrasts with no risk, no increased risk, or a slightly reduced risk with the marijuana smokers. THC actually has an anti-tumoral effect. And uh, these are studies that were done both in experimental animals and in cell culture systems, and for different kinds of cancer for lung cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, gliomas, brain cancer, that the development and growth, or the growth actually of the tumor is, is suppressed by THC, and metastases are also suppressed. So how can that be? Well, THC impairs protein synthesis, and it's what we call anti-mitogenic or anti-proliferative. You need, so tumor cells don't as readily proliferate in the presence of THC. They're also uh, anti-angiogenic, so they interfere with the growth and development of new blood vessels that are necessary for metastatic spread. And they also are pro-apoptotic. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So when cells age, there is a mechanism whereby the cells die. Uh, it's a non-necrotic death that die off the old cells and the we get rid of them before they have an opportunity to develop mutations that would lead to cancer. So enhancing apoptosis diminishes the risk of the cells becoming cancerous. So marijuana turns out, THC rather, turns out to be pro-apoptotic. So those appear to be the mechanisms that might account for these anti-tumoral effects of THC. We decided to do our own case control study. Funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a major funding agency for marijuana-related research. This was the largest study uh, ever conducted on this subject. It was very well designed. We used the U uh, Los Angeles uh, Tumor Registry to identify, rapidly ascertain, all the cases of lung cancer and head and neck cancer <clears throat> that occur, that were diagnosed in the LA County system. And uh, of course, by the time we got to some of them, they'd already died or were too sick, but we got to it over 60% of them who agreed to participate and uh, were able to participate. And we administered this questionnaire and then we matched them to controls, the uh, same age, socioeconomic status, that lived in the same neighborhood using an algorithm that USC developed for this purpose to so that we could match, you know, we're comparing apples with apples. And then we administered the, this detailed questionnaire at the food frequency questions, occupational history, all kinds of things. We also did molecular, uh, we got uh, a buckle smear so we could look at the DNA, could we look at the genetics of lung cancer. Uh, so what we did was to recruit uh, uh, smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana, um, 
at least a joint a day for a week, and it ended up that the average smoker of marijuana whom we recruited smoked three joints a day for about 15 years. And um, uh, that's we also required that they smoke that much for five years. But on the average, they smoked three joints for 15 years. So that's about 45 to 50 joint years. A joint year is, is the number of joints smoked uh, times the number of years smoked. Over the study population was, I think, be between 35 and 59. I think 35 was a younger age group. Of course, we thought that they had to be uh, teenagers in their early 20s at the time of the, at least, in the marijuana epidemic, which you know was in the, in the mid-60s. So prior to that time, very few people used marijuana, but after that time, it just mushroomed up to 1979, which represented actually the apex the acme of use of marijuana in our society. So that we, that's why we chose those age limits. And so what do we find? Uh, for any category of cannabis use, including heavy use, heavy use we define as more than 10 joint years, but we looked at 20 joint years and three joint years. For every category of marijuana use, the ratio was less than one, meaning reduced risk. It wasn't significantly reduced, but it was reduced. With, uh, and the confidence intervals were not that, that wide uh, around the point estimate. So there was no evidence. And we controlled for all the known or putative factors, uh, code for socioeconomic status, can comment, tobacco smoking, alcohol, etc. At the same time when we did a similar analysis for the tobacco smokers, there was a huge effect of tobacco. Gee, we ought to do something, Fred. Okay. How's about taking a nap? I, I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it. Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that filter blend. Yeah, Fred. Filter blend makes the big taste difference, and only Winston has it up front where it counts. Here, ahead of the pure white filter, Winston packs rich tobaccos specially selected and specially processed for good flavor in filter smoking. Yeah, Barney, Winston tastes good, like a cigarette chug. So I'm a cancer doctor, and every day I see patients with cancer who have nausea from their chemotherapy or their cancer, loss of appetite, pain, depression, insomnia, and my experience over the past 30 years of being an oncologist is that there's one medicine that I could recommend to patients that can take care of all of those problems. Instead of writing five different prescription drugs, all of which have side effects and addictive potential, uh, I can tell my cancer patients to try marijuana uh, to take care of any combination of those symptoms. The first study that I really wanted to do was in patients uh, with the so-called AIDS wasting syndrome, which was something we saw before the availability of uh, active antiretroviral drugs. And patients with HIV infection just wasted away. They lost weight, they got diarrhea and fevers. And uh, dronabinol, Delta 9 THC, became available to help those patients increase their appetite. When we prescribed those patients uh, dronabinol in the early 90s, they said, you know, this is okay, but I really prefer to smoke real cannabis because uh, when you take uh, cannabis by mouth, either as Delta 9 THC or eating, in fact, baked products, the absorption is very slow and variable. So it takes about two and a half hours for a peak to be reached and the peak level in the blood is quite low and then it stays in the body for quite a long time as well. Also when taken by mouth, uh, the Delta 9 THC becomes converted by the liver to another psychoactive metabolite. So people that take dronabinol or eat cannabis baked products often get more zonk than people who smoke because when you smoke you don't get that second metabolite. Also when you smoke you get a very rapid peak in the blood of, in two and a half minutes as opposed to two and a half hours. So people can really control the onset of the activity and how long it lasts better if they're smoking rather than swallowing either a pill or eating a baked product. So our first study that we hoped to do in the early 90s was to show that 
smoked cannabis uh, was better than dronabinol in increasing appetite in patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. I tried twice uh, to get cannabis from the government because they're the only legal source of, of marijuana for clinical trials. And both times I failed. I then went to Alan Leshner, who at the time was the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and he explained to me, in fact, that the government, uh, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has a congressional mandate only to study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So my request to have marijuana to study it as a potential therapeutic agent could never be granted by the government because, again, Congress says you can only study these substances as substances of abuse and not as treatments for disease. So in 1996, the terrain changed when we got uh, HIV drugs that actually worked and we didn't see the wasting syndrome anymore. But these drugs were broken down by the liver by the same pathway that metabolizes some illicit substances. And there was a report in the literature of a patient dying from an ecstasy overdose who was on one of the AIDS antiviral drugs who took ecstasy at the same time. So I said, uh-huh, a little light bulb went off. I said, maybe I should study to see if it's safe for patients on the AIDS antiretroviral drugs to smoke cannabis. And so I submitted that grant to the government and that worked within their schema because I was looking to see if it was harmful. And with that application, I finally succeeded and got a million dollars in 1,400 government cigarettes to study in patients with HIV. Now, these patients didn't have the wasting syndrome anymore, but the end point of our study was, is there a change in the amount of AIDS virus in the bloodstream after 21 days of exposure to either three government cigarettes a day or three dronabinol capsules or three placebo capsules. And so we looked at the change in the HIV virus and it didn't change at all. We also looked at the interaction between the cannabinoids, uh, either smoked or oral, and the amount of AIDS drug in the bloodstream and that didn't change clinically significantly either. We also knew that people were concerned that marijuana might have an impact on the immune system that could be negative and we looked at that very carefully in these HIV patients and we found no evidence of any negative effect and, and perhaps some evidence of benefit in the immune system in patients uh, smoking even more than taking uh, the, the capsules. In my opinion, the whole plant is the medicine that, that nature provided and it's, it's the best medicine. It's truly amazing uh, the number of conditions that respond favorably to cannabis. The number one condition is pain. Uh, cannabis uh, is useful in relieving people's pain. It's particularly effective in relieving pain from connective tissue disorders, from arthritis, from fibromyalgia, from systemic lupus, from reflex sympathetic dystrophy, a whole host of conditions that we don't really understand very well. People seem to get good relief from cannabis. Uh, people are able to decrease the amount of opiates that they're taking and in some instances to stop taking opiates entirely uh, for pain control. The first modern research that was done on cannabis was done in 1949 that demonstrated its usefulness in treating epilepsy. I have a number of people who don't have epilepsy when they use cannabis regularly. The founder of modern medicine is a physician named Sir William Osler who was prominent around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. He wrote the first textbook of internal medicine and in that textbook he said that cannabis was the most effective medication for the treatment of migraine headaches. And I certainly have a number of people with migraines who get substantial relief or even prevention of their migraines by consumption of cannabis. Other conditions that commonly respond favorably to marijuana include depression, uh, it helps people with sleep, it helps their appetite. Uh, it's also very good in treating uh, GI symptoms, uh, nausea, uh, diarrhea. Uh, it's excellent for treating Crohn's disease. We did a little study of people with Crohn's disease and found that many of them were able to stop using steroids and stop using other medications that they had taken for their Crohn's, that they had 
uh, less diarrhea, they had less abdominal pain. It was a true miracle for them. Uh, there's a, a list here of conditions that was originally developed by Dr. Todd McCurea, who was a pioneer in terms of medical marijuana. He actually worked for the National Institute of Mental Health and his job was to give out uh, grants for doing studies on cannabis. Uh, he thought he was there to find out how cannabis was useful to treat medical conditions. Uh, NIMH thought he was there to hand out grants to see how dangerous it was. Uh, this was a marriage made in hell and uh, he did not stay with the National Institute of Mental Health uh, for very long. Uh, cannabis is seen as a a neuroprotective agent and we have found that it has provided benefits for people with multiple sclerosis. It certainly treats their neuropathic pain and their muscle spasm, but more importantly, people who were placed on Sativex, the tincture of cannabis, uh, in early studies in Great Britain have remained on it for years and years and rather than progress, their multiple sclerosis has stayed the same, suggesting uh, that cannabis may not only be effective in reducing the symptoms, but also in slowing the progression of disease. It's helpful in dealing with the anxiety of people that have Alzheimer's disease. It's helpful in dealing with the muscle spasms that are associated with Parkinson's disease. When it comes to psychological illnesses, cannabis is useful in not only treating depression, which I already mentioned, but also bipolar disorder, which is depression and mania. It's useful in treating attention deficit disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there was a study done at the Max Planck Institute in Germany a few years back that demonstrated it was useful in uh, reducing fearful memories, so that might suggest why it uh, is useful in alleviating PTSD. This is extremely important at this time when we have uh, so many people who are serving multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Pentagon has projected that at least a third of these people, and I think that that is a very conservative estimate, uh, will come back uh, with the symptoms of PTSD. As a matter of fact, in regards to PTSD, uh, both the Israeli government and the Croatian government have given their troops uh, cannabis for treatment of, um, of PTSD. The list just goes on and on. Um, many, many conditions cause uh, pain, serious conditions, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which can actually turn you over, turn, make you bend over in a crippled position. People who have failed uh, back surgery, uh, people who have uh, herniated discs, uh, people who have chronic dislocated shoulders. All of these people get uh, relief from cannabis and they find that the cannabis provides that relief with fewer side effects uh, than uh, the opiates do. Uh, another thing that uh, is sort of counterintuitive where cannabis is useful is in the treatment of asthma. Uh, you may have seen the ads for Advair that say it's both a bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory. Well so too is cannabis. This is why there were numerous uh, marijuana cigarettes on the market in the 1920s for the treatment of asthma, specifically for uh, the treatment of asthma. So as I pointed out by holding up this list, the list of uh, conditions for which cannabis is useful is extremely lengthy. That's a, a quick overview of some of the conditions that cannabis uh, is useful in treating. Most people tend to take cannabis at least in the evening. Some people take it more often than that. And the reason is that many of these conditions interfere with sleep. And then there are some people who just have sleep problems, have insomnia difficulty. And cannabis is very useful in assisting people in going to sleep. Now, if they have difficulty staying asleep, in addition to smoking or vaporizing or using it sublingually, they should also use it as an edible or drink it because it will kick in 45 minutes into their sleep uh, and it will be effective for about five to six hours. There are a number of different ways of administering cannabis, of getting it into the body. Smoking and vaporizing cause the chemicals to get into the body upstream of the liver. 
So you have unmetabolized cannabinoids that are going to the brain. Now, this doesn't mean that when the cannabinoids go through the liver that they are inactivated, but it means that they're different. 85% of the cannabinoid is metabolized on its first pass through the liver. The other thing is that when it goes to the brain immediately by the respiratory route of administration, the effect will be in 15 to 30 seconds. Whereas if we wait for it to go through the GI tract and through the liver, it will take 45 minutes before it's effective. Now, each one of those routes of administration is going to give you a slightly different mix of chemicals because when you smoke it, you are oxygenating the cannabinoids and the other chemicals that are in there. So while you may be vaporizing the cannabinoids that are immediately behind where the flame is, uh, you're also burning uh, the cannabinoids that are right at the junction there. So that smoke marijuana is not identical to vaporized marijuana. With the vaporized marijuana, all of the volatile oils will be volatilized by the time you get to 340 degrees centigrade. And you will have removed or be exposed to about 70% fewer irritants than when you smoke it. It also has a somewhat different odor. It doesn't have the characteristic classic burnt rope odor, but it has more of a nutty odor. Now, when you eat marijuana, you're going to have metabolized 85% of the cannabinoids. People who eat it talk about having a body high as opposed to a mind high, and that is because you're being exposed to a different combination of cannabinoids. Now, some people have found that an under-the-tongue spray, which is what Sativex is, Sativex is a alcohol extract of the whole plant which combines extracts from two plants, one that's high in THC for its therapeutic value, and the other that's high in CBD to keep down the euphoria, its anti-euphoria effect. And when you spray it under the tongue, it will be effective in about 15 minutes, but it will go to the brain first before going through uh, the liver. On the other hand, there are many people in Canada where Sativex is legal that find that they still prefer uh, cannabis uh, to uh, Sativex. Uh, now Sativex uh, is prescribed in Canada uh, and it appears as though the British government and or the Spanish government may also approve Sativex in the near future uh, for sale as a pharmaceutical in their country. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration found that Sativex, basically liquid marijuana, was safe enough to be tested on Americans. And they approved a phase three clinical study, phase three just means with human beings, in December of 2005 to determine whether or not this under the tongue tincture spray was useful in relieving intractable pain in people with cancer. This study did not get started until 2007 and is still ongoing. There have been numerous studies with cannabis and tincture of cannabis uh, and pain that have shown that it is useful in relieving pain. Now, we've talked about under the tongue, we've talked about smoking, we've talked about vaporization. There's also the synthetic Delta 9 THC can be taken orally, just like edibles can be taken. Uh, and the main problem with edibles is that it's hard to tell whether you're going to get a dose that is going to just deal with the therapeutic needs that you have, whether it's going to give you euphoria or whether it's going to give you dysphoria. And you need to have a regular supply so that you uh, can be fairly certain that you're going to take an amount that will be the therapeutic dose and not an amount that will give you uh, dysphoria as uh, a side effect. Lastly, the curanderos, who are lay healers in southern Mexico and Central America, have used tincture of cannabis as part of their uh, therapeutic armamentarium for at least 200 years. The topical application of tincture of cannabis is useful, particularly on the small joints, the fingers and toes, in dealing with pain associated with arthritis. And the reason for this is that cannabis is both an analgesic, a painkiller, and an anti-inflammatory. 
And we know this not only from the anecdotal uh, evidence that we have, but also from thousands of studies that have been done around the world, uh, with mainly with animals and sometimes in tissue culture. The International Cannabinoid Research Society has been around for about 20 years, and they have uh, conferences each year that last for three days in which researchers from all over the world uh, talk about the results that they have gotten uh, doing basic science uh, studies. With any drug that a doctor is considering recommending or prescribing, they need to balance off the therapeutic effects with the side effects. When you talk about the treatment of pain, for many people, the opiates are very effective painkillers. But for some people, the opiates cause confusion. Uh, they make it difficult for them to concentrate, difficult for them to drive. Uh, they don't enjoy playing with their kids or their grandkids. It causes them constipation. With cannabis, for many of those people, they find that it certainly does not give them constipation and does not cause them confusion, provides them with sufficient relief from their pain that they can go about their activities of daily living, they can drive their car without uh, interference, and more importantly, they can have fun. They can play with their children, they can play with their grandchildren. So I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say that across the board, uh, cannabis is to be used instead of opiates. But I would say that for many people it can be used instead of opiates and for others it can be used in conjunction with opiates and they can use a lower dose of the opiates and hopefully have fewer side effects. Now any therapeutic agent that we know of has some side effects and marijuana is no exception. The main side effect to the use of marijuana is from smoking it and that's cough. So that can be completely avoided by eating it or drinking it, and it can be largely avoided by vaporizing. One of the things that's talked about a lot is that you can have a panic reaction, and that is certainly possible. It most commonly occurs in people who are novice users, particularly if they've been exposed to a plant that is very high in THC. Another thing that uh, people sometimes have is paranoid thinking that uh, the police are after them. I've noticed that this is not nearly as common since it's become legal because the police aren't after them and so it may not be paranoia that people were experiencing but an exaggerated perception of reality. And one of the, sh the uh, things that we've lost as a result uh, of the propaganda and misinformation that has been spread about cannabis is the fact that it has legitimate therapeutic value and we have discouraged research. We have dramatically discouraged research in this country and numerous other countries including uh, England, uh, Israel, Spain, and Germany are far ahead of us in terms of uh, the quantity of research that they're doing on the medicinal value of cannabis and this is particularly alarming in these economic times when we certainly could use the economic stimulus, the economic boost that would come uh, from uh, having pharmaceutical cannabis available in this country uh, as it is now in Canada and as it possibly soon will be in England and Spain. Jefferson said that this country would be in dire straits if we had laws that interfered with what we put into our own bodies. Are we not in control of our own bodies. is a medicine that patients themselves can grow. For people with cancer who may be facing thinking about the end of their life to be able to grow a plant and work in the garden and, and produce their own medicine is very empowering and, and something that you know I think does the patient a lot of good. Marijuana is 
illegal and the government doesn't sponsor this kind of research. Now, in view of the fact that large numbers of people are using marijuana medicinally, I think it's a shame that uh, there is no investment in this kind of research. I think there's a very bright future for medical cannabis in this country. I grew up around drugs, but to me, drugs are a good thing. I walked into a building or went into a building every day almost of my first 18 years. I'd had a 13 foot tall sign that said drugs. My father was a pharmacist and we sold medication. Uh, and the, as far as I'm concerned, medication is helpful for people. I don't think that medication has a personality. It sits on the shelf until uh, you prescribe it for somebody. Uh, it has beneficial uses and has side effects and it should only be used when necessary.